Hello everyone, my name is Marissa D. Michelle and today I'm going to tell you all about online lectures and what they're all about. So I'm a senior forensic chemistry and toxicology major at Westchester University. The first time I participated in a college course with an online lecture, I was taking genetics and my class of over 150 students was the guinea pigs. Our professor recorded a couple lectures and put her voice to a PowerPoint presentation, just some as I'm doing right now, and let us view the lectures on our website on our own time instead of sitting in class at 9 in the morning three times a week. However, even though I thought I understood the material, I apparently didn't because I failed that exam that included the material from the online lectures. I'm a visual learner, so when, I, when a professor tells me to read the chapter prior to our next class meeting, I never fully understand the material until I see the professor in front of the classroom clarifying, drawing diagrams, pointing out crucial information, and altogether teaching me. I began to wonder how many other visual learners are affected by online lectures, especially the other students in my class that semester. It really began to worry me when my professor told us that some courses were really being pushed into making the material online based and more students could enroll per semester. In fact, over 60% of schools across the country have either already established microphones and recording devices in their classroom or at least in the process of doing that to be able to make online lectures available for their courses. I was curious as to what the effects of online lectures were on students, whether they are either more constructive or destructive to their grades and education, and what could be done to help smooth out the issues that go along with them. If you're tuning in today, I'm hoping your professor or teacher who either might have the same fear as I did when it came to online lectures and possibly learn a little bit more about them through this presentation. So there's a couple misconceptions about online lectures that I want to bring to your attention. I had personally misunderstood some things, but I want to take the time to clarify some of that information, especially if you've had those misconceptions too. One misconception was this. In my mind, I had pictured that one day, all classes in every area of study at all colleges and universities would be converted to online lectures. I spent a lot of time researching the effects from online lectures, and I came across a lot of scientific studies on classes that have introduced these lectures, but a lot of the classes were science-based. The courses included general chemistry, laser engineering, introduction to drug information courses, dermatology and venereology, medical gross anatomy, embryology, and biology courses. Not saying that literature or language courses haven't been converted to online lectures, but it seemed like a lot of the concern dealt with these higher, more complicated, and disciplined science-based courses. So maybe it wasn't every area of study. The other misconception I had was in regards to online lectures being used as the sole source of information in a class, as in the case when the professor never sees the students' faces because the course is taken completely online. However, I found out that a lot of the courses that utilize online lectures were actually using them as supplemental, materi supplemental material. For example, Jeffrey Young, who is a senior author for the Chronicle for Higher Education, wrote an article entitled, Students Find Free Online Lectures Better Than What They're Paying For, showcasing three types of students who use online lectures. The first student needed a better understanding of anatomy and used online lectures from another professor at another university. The second student was still in high school when he watched the online lectures from a college, and that helped him expand later when he attended Princeton University in New Jersey. And the third student was actually assigned to listen to another professor's online lectures in her computer programming class, and that ultimately helped her grasp difficult concepts and pass the class. All three types of students had used these online lectures as extracurricular study aids, not just as the sole information for that course. I was also under the impression that using online lectures would hurt the students' grade rather than improve them, considering the only time I used an online lecture, I did not succeed to the best of my capabilities. However, a lot of studies had been performed on courses with the use of online lectures and the effects on the grades. Hanori Akiyama, a professor at the University of Japan, published research entitled Educational Effects of Online Lectures Using Streaming Technology. It was about a laser engineering course that was always a traditional lecture until 2000 when it began to be offered as a completely online course. However, over the years since it had been converted from traditional to online, analysis of the grades over several semesters showed that the grades were just as good in the online course, if not even better at times. In another study conducted by Grabe and Christofferson, two professors of the psychology at the University of North Dakota, the relation they studied the relationship between class attendance, the use of online resources, and examination grades. 
It turned out that over half the class used those online lectures, and they were actually video-based, so they were a little different from this one. And only 3% used audio recordings, which would be more similar to this, when they were studying for exams. However, the students still attended class, but they noted that the online lecture use increased when the students were absent. Overall, though, the students' grades had improved from the online lectures where, when they were accessed as supplemental material to their notes from class. So just like everything else, there is a list of pros and cons applicable to online lectures that I have noted throughout my research. I want to tell you about these things so you can understand both the potentially good and potentially bad that can arise from using online lectures. I'll begin with the cons though. So even though I stated earlier that a misconception about online lectures was that they would ultimately hurt most students' grades, does that mean that they never do? I have not been the only one to have done poorly in a class or on an exam from attempting to use online lectures, with, and that was the sole material provided. A study by Drs. Marion Schultz, Jim Schultz, and Jean Round was performed on four different courses at Embry-Riddle Aer Aeronautical University, and they were all taught online as well as traditional over the span of a full academic year. The four courses were analyzed individually, and they included marketing, financial accounting, aviation legislation, and college mathematics for aviation. In all four courses, the grade point average for the entire class was significantly lower for the online course as opposed to the traditional lecture course, so there will always be cases where my personal feel fear will be realized. And online lectures used as the only source to learn the material, material will hurt the students' grades. Another downside of online lectures is that it can negatively affect the professors, not just the students. Jeffrey Young, he had written another article for the Chronicle of Higher Education, but this time it was focusing on whether or not professors should record their lectures and make them public so anyone could access them. He pointed out that the other professors could steal ideas and lectures without giving credit where credit's due. A faculty member at the University of Virginia believes that the classroom is a sacred place where academic freedom should be preserved, and that's where online lectures could get in the way. Some people do not perform well when a camera is placed on them either, and when they are in the spotlight, this could even negatively affect the content of their lectures and how they explain their material. Another concern professors had about publicly publishing their online lectures is the increasing cost of college. It doesn't seem fair that some students pay an exorbitant amount of money to attend a college or university, sit through class to obtain a decent education, but someone else could take advantage of the fact that these lectures are online and essentially receive a similar education without burning a hole in their wallet. So, <clears throat> it might not always be free lectures that are available. They might You might have to still pay for them, but for the free lectures, this is when the problem arises. One of the biggest concerns Young highlights in his article is also the amount of time it takes the professor to complete an online lecture. After it has been recorded, the process of editing, revising, altering, and uploading the video onto YouTube, iTunes, or some other website is long, arduous, and increasingly difficult. I personally know some professors who claim to be so old-fashioned they don't e bother even using the university's online homework software to even post grades, so I can't imagine those people trying to maneuver through uploading an online lecture. Also, the professor I keep mentioning who did try out online lectures in our course often complained about the inconveniences she experienced while trying to upload the video onto her website. And her video was just an audio recording placed on top of her PowerPoint presentation, just like this, so she didn't even have to set up a video recorder in her classroom since she had recorded it from her home. On the other hand, there are some positive effects online lectures can still and instill. For those students who are visual learners, viewing an online lecture that is a video or a tutorial of some sort could really aid in understanding certain topics that might be hard to grasp if one were to just read about them in a textbook. Also, when an online lecture goes viral and helps a variety of students, professors can learn from them and try and incorporate those effective teaching styles into their own lectures in their own classrooms. If a professor recorded all of his or her lectures one semester, he or she could assign them in the, as future homework as in the course. Young points out that in order to keep students interested in the classroom, some professors would focus more on discussion or group projects and things that can't easily be captured on video. So time spent in the classroom could be used to build other life skills instead of just listening to a lecture and learning how to shorthand notes. And that way you can post the lectures online and get the information that way. 
Also, as previously outlined in the misconceptions section, online lectures and resources have proven to be helpful in several different courses and class settings. Online lectures could be used as a study aid, an at-home tutor, a textbook, or tutorial to help learn difficult topics and concepts and ultimately <coughs> do better in that course. Sometimes it takes someone else's different point of view on a topic with their own unique way of explaining it to be able to understand something that your own professor has difficulty describing to you. So having a free online lecture at your disposal could be a solution to that issue. So now that I've played both sides of this topic, covering the pros and cons of online lectures, I want to share with you some of the research I found of techniques that have worked in the past when it comes to using different forms of online lectures. John Basili, who is a professor of psychology, he's also the chair of the Department of Psychology at the University of Toronto Scarborough, along with his colleague Steve Jordans, they performed a study on a psychology course where the students were asked their opinions on the features online lectures can provide. The two experimenters surveyed the students, and the students reported that using the pause button on an online lecture was useful when they wanted to stop and take notes or to use the bathroom without missing any information. The students also reported that utilizing the seek button was most helpful when they wanted to review topics that weren't clear, as well as skipping over sections they thought were unnecessary or already comfortable with. Therefore, being able to use these features on an online lecture helped improve the students' examination grades and their understanding of the material. Online homework has also proven to be a very, ben very beneficial tool in some courses. Dr. Kevin Revel, a chemistry professor at Murray State University in Kentucky, performed a study on his students and found some positive results when online homework was employed. Students who completed nearly 100% of their homework correlated to about almost every A in that class. Personally, the online homework softwares that I've used in the past have been very effective, mainly because if I get a problem wrong, the programs that we used generated the correct answer and the solution completely worked out. This helped me understand my mistakes and also allowed me to work through the problem again knowing how to reach the correct answer. All this together helped me improve my exams. And Dr. Revel also utilized his tablet or PC during his class lecture and that seemed to be effective in the classroom as well. Also, the lectures were recorded and posted online, and this seemed to be very useful for ESL students or English-speaking le learners who were struggling with a language barrier in that class. Most of the ESL students' grades improved, especially because they were the ones that viewed the online lectures the greatest number of times to go back and review material that they may not have understood in class. Curtis Bonk and his colleague pointed out that there are essentially four types of learners out there. Visual, auditory, reading and writing, and kinesthetic. Sometimes he refers to it as VARC. In order for online lectures to be effective for all types of students, Bonk wrote an article called Introducing the R2-D2 Model, Online Learning for the Diverse Learners of This World, and he brought attention to this R2-D2 model and that it can be employed as a teaching or learning aid. R2-D2 stands for reading and listening, reflecting and writing, displaying and doing. For the reading portion of this model, online readings and lectures can be assigned to students as well as online group discussions to reinforce a certain topic. For the reflection portion, students can engage in reflective writing processes such as group papers, online debates, mock trials, or even provide feedback on other papers written by peers. For the displaying portion, students can engage in online interactive visual chats, develop flow charts and diagrams to help understand certain topics, take virtual tours, or participate in adventure blogging. Finally, for the doing portion, students can learn on a case-to-case -case basis, participate in online survey research, or engage in simulations. The point of integrating so many learning styles in one shot is to accommodate all types of learners. The reading and reflecting portions are more geared towards those auditory and reading and writing learners, while displaying and doing portions are more geared towards the visual and kinesthetic learners. Distance educators could hopefully benefit from Bonk introducing this R2-D2 model so they can consider adding it to their curriculums as well. So for those of you who have listened to my presentation, I'd like to first thank you for taking the time to be interested. I'm not sure how many students at colleges and universities have the opportunity to ex sincerely express themselves about the different types of courses they take. This is why I wanted to take this opportunity to provide you with the voice of a student who has had some concerns about online lectures. I know that technology is slowly overtaking our society. My generation slowly got introduced to all types of social media and technology as we grew up, and the generation after me probably won't know what it's like not to have a tablet. <coughs> 
We can't escape our ever-growing and changing world of technology, meaning we'll probably have to succumb to online lectures at some point. My goal for this presentation was to provide you all with some information on and research on online lectures. That way you can decide how you feel about this topic for yourself. And if you felt drawn to making your own online lectures, I hopefully provided you with some good example as as to the different avenues online lectures can go down in your own classrooms. I'm also hoping that because you're listening to my lecture online right now, you can get a sense of what it would be like for a student to comprehend information through this type of medium. Was it enjoyable? Was it easy? Was it a terrible experience for you? <clears throat> would it have been better if you saw my face? Would it have been better if this was in person? That's for you to decide and mull over as you walk away from this online lecture. I hope I've sparked some kind of thought as you've listened, and I've included my references in case anyone is interested in finding out more information about some of the research I had mentioned earlier. Thank you again for listening, and I hope you do well in your future endeavors as you explore online lectures.